tonight we give honor to the glory of God and to our pastor, Pastor Lois Antoine and Prayer Changes Things Ministries, to LEPC and our extended family. This is Prayer Changes Things Bible Study tonight. And tonight we're dealing with the final episode in the book of Job. The final chapters beginning with chapter 38 through chapter 42. I want to read in your hearing tonight some very fascinating scriptures that are amazing and outstanding. And it is the point of view from the Spirit of God himself questioning Job. Now that the friends have finished their conversations, now that Job has finished his conversation, we find out in chapter 38 a very marvelous thing. Beginning with verse number one, the Bible says, Then the Lord appeared unto Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkened counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. And I will question you, and you shall answer me. And this is what the Lord said. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb. When I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band. When I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors. When I said this is for you may come but no further. And here your proud waves must stop. And then I want to read to you. Uh, chapter 38 verse 22 where God asked Job this question have you entered the treasuries of snow or have you seen the treasuries of hell which I have reserved for the time of trouble for the day of battle and war by what way is light diffused or the east wind scattered over the earth this is God now speaking to Job who has divided a channel for the overflowing waters or a path for the thunderbolt, to cause it to rain, and a land where there is no one, a wilderness in which there is no man, to satisfy the desolate waste, and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass. Has the rain a father, or who has begotten the drops of dew, from whose womb comes the ice, and the frost of heaven, who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. Then I want to go to verse 31. Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades, or loose the belt of Orion? Can you bring out Mazodo in his season, or can you guide the great bear with his cubs? Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you set their dominion over the earth? Then I want you to look at verse number 34. It is amazing at this movement that God has given us that even the scientists, the astrologers, and those who claim they know science have no voice to see. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send the lightning that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the mind? Or who has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can pour out the bottles of heaven? When the dust hardens, it clumps, and the clouds cling together. Then I want to go to chapter 39 and listen to this. Here he continues to speak. Do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young? Or can you mark when the deer gives birth? Can you number the months of that they fulfill? Or do you know the time when they bear young? They bow down, they bring forth their young, they deliver their offspring, and their young ones are healthy. They grow strong with grain, they depart and do not return to them. And then I want you to look at verse 26 of chapter 39. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom and spread his wings toward the south? Does the eagle mount up 
at your command mm. and make its nest on high. My God, on the rocks it dwells and resides, on the crags of the rocks and the stronghold. From there it spies out the prey, its eyes observe them afar off. Its young ones suck up blood, and where the slain are, there it is. And then I want to go to chapter 40 and read selected verses, beginning with verse number 1. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Mm. He who rebukes God, let him answer it. This is the answer of Job. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. Mm. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yet twice, but I will proceed no further. Verse number 6 says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Hmm. Mm. Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? And then I want you to look now at the last chapter, chapter 41 and chapter 42. Job said in verse 1 of chapter 41, uh, this is God still speaking. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you pull a reed through his nose or pierce his jaws with a hook? My God. Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you lease him for your maidens? Will your companions make a banquet for him? Will they appropriate him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him and remember the battle and never do it again. I want you to now hear verse number uh, 1 in chapter 42. This is Job now. He has been humbled to the point where he repents. He's been humbled to the point that he knows that he does not know the things that God has done. Mm -hmm. And so here we see in chapter 42, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Listen to me very carefully, because this is you and this is me. He said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not, understand mm. things too wonderful for me which I did not know listen please and let me speak you said I will question you and you shall answer me here is Job in chapter 42 verse 5 I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear but now my eyes see you therefore I have hard myself and repent in dust and ashes. Yes. Now I need you to hear verse number 7. And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite my wrath is ar aroused against you and your two friends for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. And so I want you to understand now the Bible is what God has required of us to understand this fabulous book. From the beginning to the end, here these men who came to support Job but did not, now they have to come to Job to ask him to pray for them in order for God to forgive them. Mm -hmm. So we look at verse number 8. Now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. Where? Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So the Bible says in verse number 9 of chapter 42, So Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shunite, and Zophar the Nabonite went and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. 
Verse number 10, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Mm -hmm. Verse number 11 brings relationship and kinship. It says, Then all his brothers and all his sisters and all those who had been his acquaintance before came to him and ate food with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. Now I want you to hear verse number 12. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemma, the name of the second Kiza, and the name of the third Karin Haput. And the Bible says in verse 15, In all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brethren. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. I want you to understand something tonight that this was a test that began in heaven and it ended in heaven with the Spirit of God knowing exactly what Satan was trying to do when he came against Job. But we understand tonight that the tests and suffering that we go through, the hand of God is upon it and he brings us out more than a conqueror. And so tonight I want you to know that indeed we are in one of the oldest books in the Bible. And as I said to you earlier, Job was not a fictional character, no, no, no. but a man who actually lived in the land of us. According to Ezekiel 14:14, 14, 14, and according to the book of James chapter 5 and 11, we know that Job was a real man. And so tonight as we go back now and rehearse chapters 38 through chapters 42, I want you to understand the beauty of and the majesty of the eternal God who gives us now things that we never would have known except the Spirit of God revealed it to us. Listen to me very, very carefully. When we think about space, outer space, and the galaxies, and the stars, and the moon, and all of the planets, here the Lord tells us in Job chapter 38, verse 31, can you bind the cluster of Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion. Here we see in galaxies that we have just recently discovered truly actually exist. And yet we find now in the book of Job all of the marvelous things that the eternal God has done. And he reveals to us his anointed and his power. And he gives to us what it is today that we need to know that he is in control of the entire universe. He is in control of heaven. He's in control of the earth. He's in control of the earth beneath. And I want you to understand everything in between. And so tonight as we cover this fascinating journey of Job, thank God for giving us a glimpse of what it is that God can do. All power is in his hand. And so tonight, we see that beginning with chapter 38, what does God do now? He asks a question, and he says to Job, out of the whirlwind, who is this who darkened counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Can I tell you right now that you and I, with all of the knowledge we have, could not have answered these questions Amen. because we were not in the beginning of creation. We don't know how God did it, but we know God did it. And so tonight I want you to understand perfectly in your finite mind, you must trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Here tonight in this book, we find now that we are finite creatures. Amen. We are here today 
and gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But we're dealing with an eternal God who is everlasting and eternal, who has no beginning and no ending. And I want you to know that he said he's the first and he's the last. And I want you to know he says he's the A and he's the Z. And so tonight we find now that this God is requiring Job to answer. And he appeared to Job in a whirlwind. So beginning with chapter 38 in review, we look at this God calls upon Job to answer. Verses 1 through 3, Job has silenced and but not convinced his friends Elihu had silent Job, but not brought him to admit his guilt before God. It pleased the Lord to interpose, to break in on foolishness, to break in on men who did not understand what was really going on, that this battle did not begin on earth, that it began in the heavenly realm. Mm -hmm. When Satan came before the eternal God and said, Job is only happy because you have given him so much. But if you take it away, he will curse you to your face. I want you to know tonight that Job not only did not curse God, he blessed him and worshiped in his oh, presence. Yeah. And so tonight I want you to know now, God has come to bring Job to the last and final good report and to show him now things that he really did not know. The Lord in his discourse humbles Job and brings him to repent of his passionate expressions concerning God's providential dealings with him. And this he does by calling upon Job to compare Job being from everlasting to everlasting with his own time, God's knowledge of all things, with his own arrogance and God's almighty power, and with his own weakness. God tells Job out of darkness the counsel of God's wisdom with folly in a great provocation to God. Humble faith and sincere obedience to see furthest and best into the will of the Lord. And so tonight we're beginning to see now things that we not ever did know without the word of God recorded in the book of Job. Can I share with you tonight that there are things now even on the earth that we still have not discovered. Right. There are places in Brazil, in the Amazon rainforest mm -hmm. that we have not yet seen or discovered. There are depths in the sea mm -hmm. that we have not yet known. There are places in the Sahara Desert that man has not even been, That's even right. in all of these years. Yeah. And yet we come to a point to think that we know something. Can I share with you tonight we don't know anything unless the Spirit of God brings it into our memory. And here in the book of Job, beginning with chapter 38 through chapter 42, we learn some things that we would have never known had not God had counsel with Job. And so tonight I want you to know, beginning with verses 4 through 11, for humbling of Job, God here shows him his arrogance even concerning the earth and the sea and we cannot find fault with God's work so we need not fear concerning it the works of his providence as well as the works of creation never can be broken and the works of redemption is no less firm of which God, Christ himself is both the foundation and the cornerstone the church stands as firm as the earth and I want you to know that in the book of Job we see Jesus Christ in type according to Job chapter 14. I want you to know that in the first book of the Bible, Christ is mentioned. And I want you to understand tonight that we're moving now to a place where we understand that God did love us so much that he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It goes back to the oldest book and comes to the latest book the book of Revelation, where we find that God is, God was, and God ever shall be. And so here we see now in verses 4 through 11 that these are things that move us to the work of redemption and brings us now to a place where Jesus Christ comes in in focus, comes in in thought, comes in in deed, and comes now 
to redeem us and bring us back into a place of relationship with the Father. Then in verses 12 through 24, the Lord questions Job to convince him of his arrogance and shame him for his folly in prescribing to God. If we thus try ourselves, we shall soon be brought to our own that we don't know nothing in comparison to the knowledge and omnipotent of our God. And I want you to understand tonight that this book opens a door to us, even tells us that the waves in the sea are shut up by an invisible door. They can only come so far right. and go no further. Mm -hmm. My God, tonight, yeah. we are in a place now where we understand that by the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness, whose hearts are in government of the world and set to be in the sea. This means that it is hid from us. And thank God for the book of Job now, opening up the universe, opening up the earth, opening up nature, and showing us exactly who is in control. Shall I say to you tonight that I marvel at this book, and I thank God for the interpretation tonight. Let us make sure that the gates of heaven shall be open to us on the other side of death. What are you saying, Apostle, about the book of Job? You need to know the one who controls death also controls you. Amen. And I need you to understand that the Bible said he so loved us that he gave the best gift he had. That was the perfect Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And in the book of Job, we learn this illustration. In the book of Job, we understand what it means now for God to be in control and no one or nothing can hinder him from moving in our lives. And so I want you to understand that it is now a point of emphasis that we have moved to the book of Job to hear, to see, and to understand from God's point of view. Listen to me tonight. From God's counsel, we're hearing now, we should neither in the brightest noon count upon a perpetual day, nor in the darkest midnight despair of the return of the morning. Why? Because God has set it in his course. Light comes in and darkness goes out. Darkness comes in and light goes out. He set the stars, the sun, and even the moon to govern in space. And they are still there. Amen. Listen to me today. I want you to know that when I was reading this, I was amazed. I almost just, just fell prostrate. Lord, who can do these things but you? Amen. Then we look at verses 25 through 41. And it says, hitherto, God has put questions to Job to show him of his arrogance. Now God shows him his weakness. First of all, he thought he knew, but he did not. Second of all, he needed to repent. And as it but little that he knows, he ought not to arrange the divine counsels. It is but little he can do. Therefore, listen to me tonight, we ought not to oppose the providence of God. See all the all-sufficiency of the divine providence and wherewith to satisfy the desire of every living thing that is in the hand of the eternal God. Even Satan cannot do anything that God does not permit. Amen. And I want you to understand something tonight. Satan thought he had the trump card when he found out that God was laughing all the way. You need to understand something tonight, that we are in a divine setting where God is truly in control. I need you to understand tonight that he controls both the day and he controls the night. And he controls your life. And he wants to be a part of your life if you want to be a part of his environment. And the only way to do that now is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and to admit that you are a sinner that needed to be saved by grace. And when you do that, you're coming now into a place where Job had to find out that truly God 
was in control. Right. So we need to go now to chapter 39. And here, as you can see, I read to you in your hearing how God has given us what the animals that he has created are like and what they do that we did not know unless we have read this book. Let me give you an example. Job 39 verse 5. Who set the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the ogre? Whose home have I made the wilderness and the barren land his dwelling? He scorns the tumult of the city. He does not heed the shouts of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. Listen to me again. Verse number 9. Will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he bed by your manger? Can you bind the wild ox in the pharaohs with ropes? Or will he plow the valley behind you? Will you trust him because his strength is great? Or will you leave your labor to him? Listen to me carefully today. As we begin to read chapter 39, God inquires of Job concerning several animals and the propriety of their strength and how they've been created because God created them in that manner. In these questions, the Lord continues to humble Job. In this chapter, several animals are spoken of, which I just read, whose nature or situation particularly shows the power, the wisdom, and manifold works of God. The wild ass, it is better to labor and to be good for something than to ramble and be good for nothing. From the ultimate meaningness of this and other creatures, we may see how unfit we are to give law to the Spirit of God. I don't know about you, but we have people now who think they can outwit God, who think they can outdo God. But can I share with you that you are finite, you are subject to die any moment, and God is everlasting to everlasting. And so my thing for you tonight is to humble yourself like Job and admit to the fact that God is still God. Listen to me tonight. Though the gifts are not always the more valuable that makes the finest show, who would not rather have the voice of the nightingale than the tail of a peacock, the eye of the eagle of her soaring wings, and the natural affection of the stork than the beautiful feathers of the ostrich, which can never rise above the earth and is without natural affection? You know the ostrich is the largest bird, but it cannot fly. Can I share with you tonight, God has given us all of this information in the book of Job. The description of the war horse helps to explain the character presumptuous sinners. Every one turned to his course as the horse rushes into battle. When a man's heart is fully set in him to do evil and he is carried away on the wicked way, Listen to me, by the violence of his appetites and passions, there is no making him fear the wrath of God and the fatal consequences of sin. Secure sinners think themselves as safe in their sins as the eagle's is in her nest on high, in the clefts of the rocks. But I will bring thee down from thence, said the Lord, according to Jeremiah 49 and 16. All these beautiful references to the work of nature should teach us the right view of the riches of wisdom in God who made and sustained all things. The want of right view concerning the wisdom of God, which is event present in all things, let Job think and move forward to speak unworthy of the providence of God without really knowing how God operates. And so here we are moving now in chapter 40 where God humbles Job. Listen to me, and I want you to know tonight that we too should be humble enough to know that we cannot even move a rock without the assistance of someone helping us. Amen. Listen to me tonight. You cannot cause the fish to come out the sea on, except for a fish hook. Listen to me tonight. You and I are in a place tonight where we need to do as Job, humble ourselves. Listen to me. In chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. And I want to read this in your hearing. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. 
this is this. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yet twice, but I will not proceed no further. Then the Lord continued to move Job into a place where he not only humbles himself, but he also repents. Listen to me. Then the Lord answered Job out of the world went and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you arms like God, or can you thunder with a voice like his? Listen to me. I need you to hear what Job said. Job said, I am a vile person, Lord. I really didn't know concerning all of the majesty of the heavenly realm and all of the wonders in the earth realm. And so he said, I need you to understand I'm going to repent. I'm going to now bow down. And so I need you to understand now between chapter 40 verses 1 through 5, communion with the Lord effectually convinces and humbles a saint and makes him glad to be part with his most beloved sins. There is no need to be thoroughly convinced and humble to prepare us for remarkable deliverance. After God has shown Job by his manifest arrogance of the works of nature, how unable he was to judge of the methods and designs of providence, he puts a convincing question to him. Shall he that contended with the Almighty instruct him? And can I share with you, even with a PhD, even with a DD, even with the most advanced degree, you cannot question God because you don't know the answers that the earth or the sky holds. Can I share with you tonight, you are listening to what the Almighty said. Who's going to instruct him who created all things? I need you to know tonight, listen to me very carefully, that it's time for us to come back to a place where we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and ask him like David to purge us, to cleanse us, to wash us, to renew us, to revive us, and to bring us to a place where we know for a sure fact that God has laid his hands on us. Hear me tonight. We are listening to God as he speaks. Job yields himself to the grace of God, who owns himself as an offender and has nothing to say to justify himself. He now sensibly that he has sinned and therefore he called himself vile. Repentance changes men's opinion of themselves. Job is now convinced of his error. Those who was truly sensible of their sinfulness and vileness dare not justify themselves before God, but just tell the Lord as David, save me, deliver me, and set me free. He perceived that he was poor, mean, foolish, sinful creature who ought not to have uttered one word against the divine conduct of God. One glimpse of God's holy nature would appall the stoutest rebel. How then will the wicked bear the sight of his glory at the day of judgment? Listen to me. Don't enter into judgment. Enter into rest. And by resting, we come to Calvary, looking up to the Savior and allowing him to cleanse, wash, and renew us and prepare us to have fellowship with the Father, with the Word, and with the Holy Ghost. Then in verses 6 through 14, those who profit by what they have heard from God shall hear more from him. And those who are truly convinced of sin yet need to be more thoroughly convinced and more humbled. Are you hearing me? No doubt God and he only has power to humble and bring down proud men. He has wisdom to know when and how to do it. As an example, we look at Nebuchadnezzar who thought he was a mighty king only to find out that God humbled him <laughs> and put him out in the woods for seven years like an animal and yeah. brought him back to his mind to say there is no one like God. Mm -hmm. ah, I need you to understand that this book now brings us to a place where we understand that we really don't know what we thought we knew right. except it be revealed to us by the mighty hand of God. Listen to me tonight and it is not for us to teach him how to govern the world 
Our own hands cannot save us by recommending us to God's grace. It is by faith that we're saved and faith alone. And so I need you to understand tonight that this book now brings us to a place where we begin to humble ourselves before Almighty God. Yes. Listen to me tonight. Here we see the renewal of a believer proceeds in the same way of conviction, humbling and watchfulness against remaining sin. As his first conversion, when convinced of many evils in our conduct, we still need to be convinced many, many more. Why? Because the enemy is there to deceive. The enemy is there to bring us down. But if your eyes are on the star post of glory, yeah. if your mind has been transformed by the word of God, you're going to know when the enemy comes, he can find nothing in you. Yeah. And so verses 15 through 24, God, for the further proving of his own power, describes two vast animals, far exceeding man in bulk and strength. Bimont signifies beast. Most understand it to be an animal well known in Egypt called the hippopotamus. There this vast animal is noticed as an argument to humble ourselves before the great God. For he created this vast animal which is so fearfully and wonderfully made. And you know that even the lions and the elephants, even the crocodiles do not bother the hippopotamus. He is an animal that is worthy as an adversary. And I want you to know that when you study these animals, you see the fierceness mm. and the majesty of the true and living God. So every godly man has spiritual weapons. And I want you to understand tonight that you need to put those weapons to use, the whole armor of God, so that you can quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Because Satan is always on track, trying to turn us back. And even as he came to attack Job, that same devil is attacking you and I need you to understand tonight that you need to understand that the God that you have placed your heart in is the God that's going to cover and protect you the God that's going to lean on you to bring you out of the valley and the shadow of death and so now we're looking at chapter 41 here we see there is an animal that even now in the 21st century in 2023 we still don't understand and that is can you draw out leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lure can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaws with a hook and the answer is no sir because this animal is a huge animal and strong and mighty and man does not want to fool with him so the description of the Viatin is yet further convinced that Job of his own weakness and of God's almighty power. Whether this Leviathan it be a whale or a crocodile is disputed. The Lord having shown Job how to, unable he was to deal with the Leviathan set forth his own power in the mighty creature. I need you to know that in such language describe the terrible force of Leviathan, what words can express the power of God's wrath? And I want you to understand something tonight. You don't want to incur the wrath of God. And the only way to avoid the wrath of God is to seek his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And once you do that, then wrath has passed, judgment has passed. And you have entered into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Job is a powerful work in the message of God to show us the anointed and the power of God in the universe, in space, in the earth, and in the animals. And you need to understand now that this is a time for you to move forward and to understand and know that you are in the hand of of a mighty God and when you repent he's going to change your venue turn things around and so we see in chapter 42 then this is the final chapter in the book of Job that Job humbly submits to God Job intercedes for his friends and God returns him now into prosperity mm. I need you to understand that this has been one of the most marvelous books that we can study because it shows us heaven's point of view. It shows us the very entrance to God's throne. And it shows the enemy of our souls ever trying to persecute 
and cause us to fall from grace into sin. And I want you to understand tonight that the devil was defeated and Job was rewarded. Why? Because through it all he humbled himself before the mighty hand of God and he repented. Listen to me. Chapter 42 verses 1 through 6. Job was now sensible to his guilt. He would no longer speak of his own excuse. He abhorred himself as a sinner in heart and life, especially for mummering against God, and took shame to himself. When the understanding is enlightened by the spirit of grace, our knowledge of divine things, as far exceed what we had before in the sight of the eyes, excel, report, and common frame. By teaching of men, God reveals his son to us. But by the teaching of his spirit, he reveals his son in us. And I want you to understand something tonight. It's not only an important fact that you know Jesus. The important fact is does Jesus know you? Right. It's important for us tonight to understand that this book of Job brings us to the point now where we must understand that we must have a relationship with the eternal God who will protect us and keep us in perfect peace. And so tonight I want you to understand that here we see Job now humbles himself and we find ourselves in a place where he repents. We find ourselves in a place where he understands that God is the God of eternity and the God that created all things. And so in verses 7 through 9, chapter 42, after the Lord has convinced and humbled Job and brought him to repentance, he owned him, comforted him, and put honor upon him. Listen to me. The devil has undertaken to prove Job a hypocrite, and his three friends had condemned him as a wicked man. But if God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, it is of little consequences who say otherwise. When people think they know about you, but they really don't. Why? Because they're trying to say what you did in the past. But the past has been forgiven. The present has been secure. And your future is irrevocable. I need you to understand once you have given your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that was done before that point of salvation has been washed away. And like Job now, you have become a servant of the Most High God. And so I want you to know now God tells these three miserable men who came to comfort Job but did not that it is up to Job now to pray for them. And as he prayed for them and they sacrificed the sacrifice that God told them to do, they would be forgiven. And then we find now that all that Job had has been returned, including his family, including his wealth, including his wife. And now God has given him three more daughters and seven sons. And I want you to know tonight as we get ready to look at this for ourselves, you need to understand the review and the passage of Job and how it affects us as believers. And I want you to understand tonight that this is very important now for you to know. There is a lot you can learn from the characters in the Bible that draw powerful lessons that will help us to navigate the issues of life. But also, and Job is one of the first to show us the pathway back to God. I need you to understand now, let's review so that you can understand where you are and what's going on. Job, a man who had an incredible story of recovery from loss. He was not an Israelite, for Israel was not yet formed yet, but was from the land of Uz. They believe Uz is connected with the kingdom of Edom. In modern times, this would be roughly around the southwestern part of Jordan and Israel. Hear me tonight. The Bible credits Job as one who was blameless, upright, feared God, and hated evil. Job had a wife, seven sons, and three daughters, and had a great possession of sheep, camel, oxen, duncans, and a very large household. Basically, you name it, Job had it. He was extremely blessed and was considered the greatest man of all the people of the East. Are you listening to me tonight? There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. 
and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were seven thousand sheep, three thousand camel, five thousand yoke of oxen, five hundred female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. Job chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. Can you see now while he was an object of the devil? Because the devil now thought he had something going on. That if he took all of this away, that Job would curse God. Listen to me. But his response was remarkable because he started by worshiping God. And he never sinned or blamed God foolishly. I want you to understand tonight that you need to understand that there are lessons to learn. That you don't understand all that's going on in your life. But you understand who is in control. Eventually, I want you to understand tonight that we see in chapter 42, God restores to Job double for everything he had lost in his later years was better than the previous one. He chose to trust God with an unwavering faith, and we can learn a lot from his story. That's why we're presenting it to you tonight. From the life of Job, we can learn five powerful lessons that you need to understand. Number one, don't blame God for your misfortunes. Are you hearing me tonight? Don't blame God for your misfortune. You probably come across people who were mad at God because of a terrible thing that happened in their lives. Or maybe that person was you. It's a natural human reaction to blame God because you believe he allowed something bad to happen in your life. If we learn from Job's story, we can deal with difficult situations in our lives and still acknowledge God as powerful and almighty. He is the one who is able to restore our lives and help us rise up again. According to Romans 8 and 28, you know it well. It tells us that all things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Trust that God will bring good out of the difficult circumstances that you are dealing with today, whether that's sickness or whether that's financial uh, discrepancy. Whatever the situation is, if you trust in the Lord, he will bring you out. For the book says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who will love God to those who are called according to his purpose. And since you've been called according to his purpose, he's going to bring you out. He's no respecter of persons. If he brought out Job, he will bring you out. And then number two, recognize the power of prayer. I don't know about you tonight, but when I look around at the church today, I don't see a lot of praying people. When I grew up back in the 50s and the 60s, we had a time of prayer before service where we got on our knees and prayed until the power of the Lord came down. Here I want you to know that we need to go back to the spirit of prayer. Go back to seeing the results that God can do when you pray on your knees or standing or on prostrate on the floor, giving glory and honor to the king who makes a difference in your life. Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar had not well spoken of God as they were trying to advise Job regarding his predicament. God told Eliphaz that he and his two friends should go to Job so he can pray for them and God's judgment would not fall on them. I want you to know tonight that's a song we used to sing, somebody prayed for me. They had me on their mind. They took a little time and prayed for me. I need you to understand tonight that your mom, your dad, an uncle, or an aunt, a cousin, or a nephew, somebody went to God on your behalf and brought prayer in your life. And I want you to know that when we look at this, we find out now that the prayer that Job prayed was so powerful that God forgave the three of their folly and God will forgive you. And so tonight I want you to go back to that spirit of prayer. Go back to the place where you understand and know that God will hear and answer your prayer. Number three, God's purpose in your life will always stand. Listen to me. There's going to be storms according to Matthew chapter 7 beginning with verse 24 through 29. The wind's going to blow. 
Are you hearing me? The floods are going to come. Ah, oh my God. I need you to understand that through all of this, if you've built your house on a solid foundation, you've built it on the rock, that is Jesus Christ, that when the storm is over, you too, like Job, will stand. Listen to me. When we have been through the worst and we feel that years of our lives have been wasted, we can conclude that we will never fulfill God's purpose. We're too old for this. We're too old for that. Well, I want you to know that that's a lie from the pit of hell. The truth is that the plan and purposes of God for your life will still be fulfilled. Ask me how I know. When Moses started out at the age of 40, he was fleeing going away from Pharaoh, but he went into the wilderness for 40 years. But it was until he was 80 that God used him, and God used him up to the age of 120. You still have time to focus and to believe and do the work that God has assigned you to do. Your circumstances may have led you to believe that you will never do anything great for God, but remember that it is never too late to fulfill God-given purpose. And I like to say to someone, God can win with any hand he is dealt with because he's God and because he knows the end from the beginning. Number four, wisdom comes from God. We usually assume that it is elderly who are wise, those who have been through, like I am at the age of 77. But I want you to know that the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who will give to him liberally and upbraid it not. I want you to understand tonight that Proverbs 3 and 5 is very definite a part of our lives. If you trust in God with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, guess what? He will direct your path. And I want you to know tonight that when you consider where wisdom comes from, it comes from God, then you know that even those who think they are wise, they must seek the wisdom that only God can give. Listen to me tonight. It's so important. Elihu was a young man who was full of wisdom, and he recognized that at his age he was wise. He attributed his wisdom to the Holy Spirit. But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty giveth him understanding. Great men are not always wise, nor do the age always understand justice. Job 32, 8 and 9. Hear me tonight, God gives us divine wisdom which is higher than our human wisdom or understanding and we can see things not just naturally but also spiritually through the eyes of the wisdom of God. This is what I said to you earlier, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to you. So according to James 1 and 5, you need to ask tonight for the wisdom of God just how to live day by day. Listen, Job lost everything in one day, but through it all he gained it back double for his trouble. Then I want you to know tonight that God speaks to many of you through dreams. If you been think that this is such a thing that doesn't happen, listen to the word of God. According to Job 33 verse 14 and 15, for God does speak not one way, now another, though no one perceives it in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people. And sometime God is speaking to you through the night, he will wake you up early. And what does he wake you up for? To begin to pray and to meditate and to thank him for what he's going to do. This means that you need to pay attention to your dreams and pray and ask God for revelation. Not all dreams are from God, but if you ask him to help you identify your dream, he will. And when you have dreams, write them down so that you can have a record of what they are and what God is saying to you. Tonight, the dream is for you to wake up and to come to the grips of understanding that God is yet in control and that the devil can do nothing that God does not permit. Well, finally, let me get to you tonight by saying to you in a final review, looking back at the whole story of Job, what do we really see? What are we to make of Job? The Bible says in the long New Testament reference to Job, James holds him up as an example of faithful perseverance, James 5 and 11. So hear me tonight, we are in a place now where here was a real man 
who went through a real problem, who dealt with a real situation. And though he had to go through some things to realize that the righteousness was of God and not of him, he came out as a conqueror. He said that when he try me, I shall come forth as gold. And I want you to know tonight that when God tries you, you too shall come forth as gold. Oh, the old folk used to say, you see, not what I used to be, but what now Jesus in me shows me how to move about and to move in the things of God. And so tonight when we suffer, we wonder if God really cares. Job sees God as the cause of his problem. And as a result, he sees God as the one who must provide the solution. Hear me tonight. As the German poet Goethe said, and so the last sailor lays firm hold upon the rock on which he has been dashed. He protests, may be fierce, but he continues to address the complaints to God. It becomes clear through the dialogue with his friends that on God himself only can comfort Job. And so tonight, what are we to make of God? We make the fact that he is in control, that he understood what was going on, and he allowed the enemy to come in to show the devil that the reality is that Job was a man who loved God, who feared God, who sacrificed to God, and who was worthy to be honored and brought back double fold. Listen to me tonight. We see that the central character of this book isn't Job, but it's God. We too are faced with the central question of the book, does Job fear God for nothing? That was the words of the devil. In other words, is there a God who's worthy of our worship, who love us and trust us regardless of our circumstances? Will we fear him even when he's not acting in the way we think he should act? We cannot understand what he's allowing to happen to us, but can we trust God when what we're experiencing seems to be disturbing? as a traversity of justice and the answer is yes because he is in control and i said to you earlier according to the book of romans 8 and 28 all things are going to work out for our good because we are the called of the righteousness of god and so tonight i need you to understand that as we end this book you need to know our praise our adoration our thanks for God to even write this book for us to understand that it begins in heaven, comes to the earth, and goes back to heaven because God is in control. I need you to understand tonight when God doubly restores Job what he's lost, he did it because he was God. And because Job understood the fact that what he lost, he said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I want you to understand something tonight, that this is the place now for us to move forward and to begin to praise God and to begin to thank God that he is in control. Listen to me. You and I tonight, in this day, the month of June in 2023, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future, and that is the eternal God. And so we know now that Job, the innocent sufferer, also points us to the ultimate innocent sufferer, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus suffered anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane and later pronounced his own cry of desperation. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Mark 15 and 34. But as in Job, when it's all said and done, there is a happy ending. It was a happy ending for Job and a happy ending for Christ. Because after three days in the grave, he got up with all power in his hand. And so tonight, I want you to know, may Job point us to Christ and so encourage us to endure in faith to the very, very end. You need to understand tonight that there are some things we need to know there are some things we need to cherish. There are some things we need to just ask the Spirit of God to help us to understand. And so let me close tonight by telling you this is a point of emphasis. You need to know that bad things happen to good people. Let me share that with you. Bad things happen to good people. 
The book of Job opens in a verse one by telling us that Job was a blameless, upright yes. man who feared God and turned away from evil. Then his life unraveled. Job's suffering did not come because he was bad, but rather because he was unwaveringly faithful to the Spirit of God, according to Job 1 and 8. Number two, in the midst of suffering, we must never lose our hope in God. Listen to me. I need you to understand that in the midst of whatever you're going through tonight, put your hope in the Word of God. The Bible said in the book of Psalms 107 and 20, he sent his word to heal, to deliver, and to bring you out of destruction. Isaiah 55 and 11 says, when his word go out, it will not return empty or void, but will accomplish that that pleases him. So tonight, I want you, whoever you are on the conference line, whoever you are on Facebook Live, put your hope in God. And watch the statement and testimony that you will have when God bring you deliverance and bring you out. Number three, our friends may fail us in the midst of our misery, but God never does. Job's friends put him on the defense. Job said of his three friends, miserable comforters are you all. Job 16 and 2. Job proclaims where his deep strength flow lies. He says, for I know my Redeemer lives. And the last, he will stand up on the earth. And after my skin worms have been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Job 19, 25 through 27 points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord have mercy. One day we will see with our own eyes our Redeemer. If you have been saved and delivered by the blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He's alive today and forever and because he lives, we can face tomorrow. So don't allow your friends to come and tear you down. Please get encouraged and encourage yourself to go forth in the things of God. Number four, even in the midst of God's silence, his presence is still in us. The Bible says greater is he that is in us yeah. than he that is in the world. So no matter how silent it may be, according to what you're going through, remember this, my friend, God is still with us. Listen to this. But he knows the way that I take. Mm -hmm. And when he has tried me, ha, I shall come out as gold. My God, my foot has held fast to his steps. I've kept his way and have not turned aside. I've not departed from the commandment and the commandments of his lips. And I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. Job said in Job 23, 10 through 12. In other words, and through all that I've suffered and everything that I've gone through, I found out that God is still with me. Mm. Number five, wisdom comes from fearing God and turning away from evil. Listen to me. I said wisdom comes from fearing God and turning away from evil. Humility is the key. Pride can interfere with us following the wise ways of the Lord. When pride interferes, it clouds our vision. And before we know it, we are on the wrong path toward evil. But I need you to understand if you stay with Proverbs 3 and 5, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Number six, God is with us in the midst of our storms. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is our good shepherd. And he never leaves our side. Mm -hmm. He walks us through the valley and the shadow of death. He restores our soul when we're weary. He leads us in the path of righteousness for his namesake, even when we have lost our way. He gives us courage when we are scared. And he controls us when we are hurting. Our God is the comfort in the time of a storm. Let me hurry on to a close tonight. Let me share this with you. And I want you to hear me real loud. God is still in control. God is the creator of the universe. He's the maker. I read that to you from Job 39, Job 40, Job 41, Job 42. God is the creator of the universe. He is mighty and powerful. As a matter of fact, he's all powerful. We can trust him with our lives. 
We see in Job chapter 1 that nothing came to the life of Job which did not first go through the hands of a loving God. Every page of scripture points to his sovereignty. And I want you to know from the creation account in Genesis to the return of Christ in Revelation, our God is still in complete control. Number eight, sometimes in the midst of our suffering, we sin. Let me say that again. Sometimes in the midst of our suffering, we sin. God accepts the humble and repentant heart. In Job 42, we see Job surrender to God and repent. Job recognized that God is the creator and he is the just one for all of his creation. So Job said in Job 42 and 6, and I read it to you earlier, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Number nine, sometime we sin against our friends. Job's friends not only fail to be there for Job in a supportive role, loving way, but they gave poor advice based on their misunderstanding of God. That's why you need people who know the word of God for themselves. Not misquote it, not throw it out as if they know it, but know it from the book itself. The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as Job my servant said. Job 42 and 7. Finally, I want you to know tonight, after repentance and forgiveness comes the blessing. Ah! Hallelujah. After repentance and forgiveness comes the blessing. In Job 42, we find Job made a burnt offering for his friends and prayed for them as God commanded him to do. God accepted Job's prayers for them. And then Job's fortune was restored when he prayed for his friends. Isn't that an interesting connection? Job forgives his friends before he knew how blessed he was about to become. It was not Job's prayer that released blessings. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. Job 42 and 12. Let me conclude the night with this. Lord, thank you, Jesus. When we are feeling stressed and frustrated and wounded by this world, may we step back and take a look at all of God's creation. Get outside under the big sky and remind yourself who God really is. Then get into his word and learn more about God and how God loves you. Trust that if he can create and sustain the entire universe, my God, surely he can take care of you. So tonight as I close, I need you to understand from the book of Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 through 34. It's very important that I read it because this is what Jesus said. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Are y'all hearing me tonight? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Verse 27, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Verse number 30, But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Verse 33, But seek ye the kingdom of God, and its righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day of its own trouble. So if our Heavenly Father feeds the sparrows and clothes the lilies, surely he will take care of us in the midst of our trials. In the end, God rewarded Job for his faithfulness, and may we be found faithful today, working in the vineyard and trusting in the Lord who created heaven and earth. 
Father, in the precious name of Jesus, tonight we come to ask, first of all, like Job, for forgiveness, to strengthen us now in our heart, to renew us now in our mind, to transform us to the point of emphasis that whatever trial or tribulation we're going through, you are in control. Therefore, tonight we offer, even as Job, repentance and saying, Lord, touch us now. Refine us as we come through the fire, that when we have come through, we shall come through as pure gold. Touch us now and bring conviction in our lives that no matter what's going on, we're going to stand on the solid rock. And that rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. 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 You're back into the hands of our pastor. Pastor Lois, and we give God glory for you. Amen. As I said earlier, no matter what you're going through, remember Job made it, and so can you. Amen. So until I talk to you again on Facebook Live or see you in a special service, this is Apostle Ellie Anderson saying, Go with God. You're in the hands of our pastor, Pastor Amen. Lois.